I'm Gabe Zickerman. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Remember Me, and we make uh, Beam Me, the world's most popular uh, mobile networking platform. I am a pretty social person, so I meet a lot of people. I go to a lot of trade shows and events, and what I found was that after every event, I had a huge pile of business cards, and more so even than the irritation at having to you know, enter the business cards, which invariably meant that I, I didn't do anything with them and just pushed them aside, was the fact that I realized that I didn't remember half the people in those cards. They were fleeting moments, they were handshakes, and maybe our interaction was meaningful at the time, but you know, later at my office, I didn't know who they were. And then it dawned on me that, of course, if I didn't remember who they were, they didn't remember who I was. And so I said, well, why can't we solve the problem of people being able to make a meaningful socially networked connection and remember each other using these incredibly powerful computers that are in our pockets? So I immediately took a look at the existing solution, the one that most people had thought about uh, when I say uh, beam contact information between phones, most people immediately think of the Palm Pilot, which had this functionality um, you know, more than 15 years ago. And one of the problems with the Palm Pilot solution was, of course, that it was pretty kludgy. Like you took two phones and you pointed them at each other and then you pressed the button and you waited and you didn't want to shake it. You really had to hold still. And then eventually a beep would go off and you'd press a button on both sides and yay, you'd share a contact. And even if you could get over the sort of hassle of that process, um, the reality was it only worked from palm to palm. And that's what doomed it, of course, as a nothing more than a gimmicky, you know, um, artifact of that particular era. So we said, well, there has to be a simple, easy to articulate and, and even easier to use solution for sharing contact information and discovering people who are meaningful business contacts. And so from that came Beam Me. I, uh, you know, I came up with the idea for Beam Me, you know, one day when, you know, I was just frustrated about the process. And I had a long-term friend, uh, a guy by the name of Christopher Cunningham, who's a mobile entrepreneur who had sold his last company around the same time that I sold mine. And we were good personal friends. Um, and, uh, you know, I asked Chris to help me prototype the first versions of the product. And at the end of the prototyping process, I said, well, Chris, you know, I know that you're enjoying your sort of relaxed lifestyle. So maybe you could help refer me to someone who might make a good CTO and uh, co-founder. And Chris said, well, what makes you think that I'm not interested in doing that with you? And I was like, well, this is a magical moment in our lives because I have a lot of respect for you. You're clearly very technically literate. Um, you know, you're in the right space and, um, you know, we're friends. And so, hey, why not? do this together. So we started the company, Chris and I, um, you know, started the business uh, really in earnest in 2007 um, and got to work here in New York City building Beamy. Let me say this to you. I think I meet a lot of entrepreneurs and now I speak to a fair number of entrepreneurs, which is a tremendous honor. And one of the things that I've learned is that the most difficult thing in the world is to move that train one foot out of the station. 99.9% .9 of the population has an idea that's stewing in their head right now and their train is firmly in the station. And it's the very, very small percentage of them who can move just ever so slightly. And once you get that first little bit of motion, the rest of it is momentum that's surprisingly easy to accomplish. But ideas in and of themselves really aren't that valuable. It's the ability to take that idea and, and turn that into something meaningful and turn that into a product that you know, ultimately people want to buy, uh, whether it's companies or individuals. That's really the magic of entrepreneurship. And so what I tell everybody, what I told a group of gay uh, aspiring entrepreneurs, um, MBA students, just this past week in Atlanta, what I tell everybody is that first foot. Whatever is holding you back from moving your idea forward, set it aside. Do it. Do something. Take it, product, you know, do a demo of your product, build a prototype of your product, mock it up, um, do it, try it. You know, there's no downside to doing that first step. My role model is my mom, who is a crazy serial entrepreneur. Um, my mom, you know, is, is literally the best salesperson I've ever met in my whole life, and I've had the privilege of working with some astonishing salespeople. And, you know, from a very early age, my mom had these side businesses, um, which eventually became her principal, um, you know, form of income and, and effort. And, you know, she was never happier than when she, you know, had her little company selling uh, fancy imported food or uh, cookware, which were the two businesses for which she's, um, you know, probably best known. And, you know, from a very early age, I used to sell with her. 
uh, from around the age of 10, we'd go to these markets uh, around uh, Toronto, which is the city where I grew up. And, you know, it wasn't necessarily the most fun thing process-wise because it was a 4 a.m. start on a Saturday morning. And we'd get into the truck and we'd load it up and we'd drive out, um, you know, to wherever the market was being held. And we'd set up our booth and then I would, you know, not the whole day because I was an excitable young kid, but I'd spend a big chunk of my day in the booth selling jam or cookware or whatever it was that we were working on and, um, you know, just watching my mom sell. And uh, that was the inspiration, you know, probably for everything that I've done, which is it's that moment where you get out of bed and you get up in front of people and you say, this is my uh, heart on a plate and would you like to buy it? Um, is the moment that you, you know, can move forward and the moment that you can accomplish the things that you want to accomplish. I think you have lots of moments of tremendous uh, elation and tremendous disappointment when you're an entrepreneur. I think every single day is a roller coaster. And in fact, uh, I don't think there's a day that goes by that I don't hit some new high and I don't hit some new low. You know, you wake up and think, what am I doing? What did I do with all my money? What am I doing with all these other people's money? What am I doing with all my staff's time? Like, this is crazy. We're never going to get there. And then, you know, like today, I spoke on the phone to one of our top customers. I, I actually personally call each one of our top customers on a sort of rolling basis because I, I believe in talking to them and finding out what they're about. And, you know, it was a, it was like Christmas, Hanukkah, and Kwanzaa rolled into one experience. I mean, he was talking my ear off about how much he loved Beamy and how much it had changed his workflow and how, you know, it was meaningful and ours was one of the best products he'd ever used in his whole life. I mean, what's better than that? But similarly, when someone writes a bad, annoying uh, review of our applications in the App Store, I'm on the far opposite end of the scale. So every day is a roller coaster and probably the uh, most meaningful advice that I can give about the actual process of running a company is that you have to be ready for that. And um, being the CEO of a startup really is probably the worst job in the whole world, as far as I can tell. Because, uh, you know, CEO of your own startup, you're everybody's bitch. You are your employee's bitch. You are your investor's bitch. You are your customer's bitch. Pardon the expression. The reality is that you um, you're absolutely positively moved by what all those people do. You are here to turn this great creaking ship in the direction that you want to turn it in. And you don't get to fly off the handle and decide what you want to do and go to Aspen like everybody assumes you do, like CEOs of public companies do. CEOs of startups cannot act like that. I just, I can't say what's on my mind. If I said what was on my mind all the time, I'd have no employees, investors, or customers, right? So it's, there's a lot of like, grin and bear it. And in that process, you develop a unique skill set to filter what's important and what's not and to be able to, you know, stay focused on the big picture prize. And despite the fact that being an entrepreneur is one of the worst jobs in the whole entire world, I can't imagine doing anything else. The marketing plan for Be Me really um, was organic and focused on the virality of our product. But I'm also a big believer in sort of traditional PR in quotes, and I think that includes getting blog coverage and getting you know, media coverage. If you make apps for mobile devices, probably the most meaningful coverage that you can get is being featured in the app stores for whatever platform you're working on. So for us, early on in BME's lifecycle, we were featured on the uh, iTunes app store. Um, we were written up um, in the Times and um, through a bunch of syndication and also um, you know, we were actually featured on the apple.com start page. So we got a bunch of initial kind of momentum uh, for the product that way. And then we've had a generally uh, pretty good kind of PR air cover and viral ground cover for the distribution of our product. Whenever a new platform launches, and I've been really fortunate to be around for, you know, right on the cusp of the launch of the internet, really, um, the launch of Facebook, for example, and the iPhone, and been involved at Cisco Systems, and then you know, my last kind of focus, and then now this new startup at each one of those things, what you realize is that in the very early days, a handful of developers with good ideas and the right focus take a disproportionate um, have a disproportionate success out of the launch of a new technology platform. And that's pretty consistent, but it's very unusual for those early, early succeeders to get to the next stage of the game. And typically, the real money is made by the people who come immediately after that first group. The first group is kind of big land grab, and then there's some shakeout, and then it's the second group who really seems to make a uh, you know, big go of it. 
And so what I would say is, especially if you're developing apps today, I think the opportunities are still tremendous. However, the likelihood that you'll make an amazing single $1 application that will make you millions of dollars, I think is pretty slim. Those were always corner cases. That was not the norm, even at the dawn of the iPhone. That has never been the norm. That will never be the norm. A handful of people win the lottery, effectively, um, by being at the right place at the right time and with a great app. It doesn't take anything away from that. But the rest of the people, we got to slog it out. So just like any other platform, you got to make great product. you got to excite your customers. You have to market that product well. Um, you need to know what your customers love and keep iterating against that, you know, that vision of, uh, of really... Um, solving a customer problem every day. I make a ton of mistakes. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I make an absolute ton of mistakes. I make mistakes every single day. I make mistakes probably multiple times a day. And if you listen to my business partner or my life partner or my parents, they'd probably um, have an even better list uh, of mistakes they could share with you. And I'm so hypercritical um, of myself and the world around me that it would be difficult for me to you know, really single out one thing where I would say, there are some things, Sonny, I did wrong. Well, one thing I can tell you, though, is that in the context of a life full of mistakes, the smartest people in the room are the ones who know they've made a mistake. And without hubris, uh, turn away from that, acknowledge it, move on, close that door, open a new door when they need to do that without um, getting stuck somewhere, you know, for like Afghanistan or <laughs> Iraq, you know, like at some point you have to say, I made a mistake, this was the wrong thing to do, and I'm moving on. And, uh, you know, if there's one that I probably, um, you know, that probably like, that's not even really a mistake, but if there's, if there's one experience in my past I think is kind of interesting, you know, I, I like to be liked, like I suppose everybody likes to be liked, and, um, you know, I remember in Trimedia, which was the, my last startup, uh, you know, I had one business meeting with someone that was a, uh, you know, I thought was a pretty good meeting, maybe tough, but a pretty good meeting, and afterwards I heard back that that person who was a client we were trying to close, um, the president of that company had said, under no circumstances will I do a deal when Gabe's around. He needs to never be there. Um, you know, I never want to see him again. I just think he's terrible and obnoxious and I just don't want him involved. And at the time, I was crushed. I mean, I did all this business development. I, you know, a fairly well-known figure in the games industry and I'm like, this is crazy. You know, what did I do you know, to piss this person off? And, um, you know... Uh, I, I was probably really fractured by that for a long time. Um, you know, I would say certainly that I, um, took that much more personally and much more to heart than I, you know, probably should have. And, uh, turns out this person doesn't remember that at all. And, you know, now I know him and we talk and it's all cool. And he's like, what are you talking about? And, um, you know, it's sort of funny in retrospect, but, you know, I'm still carrying it around by the way. And it's been like, you know, a solid 10 years. Um, uh, and I still think about it sometimes like, gosh, that was a terrible moment, you know? Um, so the mistake that I really made in this case was to harp on somebody not liking me when, you know, being liked is really not that important. Um, you hear that a lot. You hear that from self-help coaches. You know, it's your parents tell you that when you're in school. It's not that important that you be liked. It's you should be respected. That's what's really important. But of course, everyone wants to be liked. So we're deluding ourselves if we think we don't want to be liked. But when you encounter a situation in which somebody uh, has expressed a dislike for you in a business context, I think the best thing to do is turn away from the situation, move on in a different direction, stay away from it, don't harp on it. In the end, they'll get over it. That's what I've learned. It's funny, because I was talking about this with uh, a woman named Amy Arrett, who was one of the co-founders of E-Trade and um, Olivia Cruz's. The other day, we were on a panel together at a gay MBA conference. And you know, we were talking a little bit about what, it, what does it mean to be a gay entrepreneur and what are the challenges? And both of us sort of asserted that there really weren't any, um, as far as we could tell. And principally, I believe that um, there's still a ton of homophobia in the world and there's a ton of homophobia in the business world. But because I've been very out and um, very explicitly out in my life and in my professional life from the beginning, I just don't hear it. So if you don't like me because I'm gay or you don't want to do business with me because I'm gay, then I probably just don't even know that because you're just steering clear of me, you know? It's when you're closeted and people don't know that you're gay that you hear and see the things that are otherwise unsavory, you know? And I just, I don't necessarily want to change everybody's mind in the world about, um, you know, about homosexuality or Judaism as I'm a Jew and, or, you know, any of the things that I'm, you know, passionate about, but... 
Uh, what I do want is I do want to be in an environment in which I'm respected and I have an equal opportunity to be successful. And so I'm creating that every single day by putting my parameters out there and saying this is who I am. Um, gay, Jewish, chubby, you know, uh, now in my mid-30s, this is who I am. And, uh, you know, you can self-select out of my world if you'd like and, you know, so be it. I think one of the, I think one of the challenges for, like, all gay professional people is this idea that um, you're going to be faced with a world that's hostile to you and your lifestyle and, you know, um, but really it ends up being more quotidian than that. I think when you've worked, especially in the corporate world, which I mostly eschewed in my, in my professional career, but when you work in the professional world, most of the hassle factor of being gay is that you... Uh, on Monday morning, you come into the office and your friends are talking about their kids and their, uh, you know, their spouse and what they did for the weekend and the golfing that they did. And if your lifestyle is not those things, if you're not a gay person with kids and a spouse and golfing, then you're sort of forced to like interpret what part of your life the other person does or doesn't want to hear and what's contextually relevant and you know what um, is or isn't going to make them uncomfortable and. I think, um, I think that's actually a complicated dance um, at first, and then over time, what you realize is you uh, gain traction on that. So not being Pollyanna, I am saying that I think single straight people have some of the same issues in a culture where um, you're around a lot of married people or married people with children. There's a sort of expectation often that uh, people who are married with children can go home at four o'clock because they have to attend to their kids, and of course, who would say, no, you can't go pick your kids up from school, you know, whereas the single person or the person without kids doesn't get to do those things. Um, and that, I think, is more a, like a family status, equality, fairness issue than it is a sexuality, fairness, and equality issue. And so a lot of, so to me, my observation has been that most issues related to sexuality in the workplace are actually issues of family status and gender, and rather than sexuality, strictly speaking. And that um, once you put those things into context, then there's a layer certainly of like explicitly sexuality related issues. Um, but most of it is about um, family status and gender. I will say one thing though, which is I have the benefit of being an entrepreneur and um, the benefit of living in, you know, in the technology business and the games industry and, and being an entrepreneur in those environments. And so in those, in the context of entrepreneurship and technology and, and the games industry, um, of course I can be out. I mean, it's my company. So in that way, I can build a corporate culture that matches the environment that I want to work in and are re built with people who I respect and who respect me and who I feel comfortable with and with whom I want to come into work every single day and enjoy the, you know, basically the relationship that I'm building with them, you know. And that's a degree of control that I don't have in many other aspects of being an entrepreneur, but I certainly do in terms of who gets hired um, to work at my company. And... Um, that's definitely one thing that's uh, rewarding about being an entrepreneur that you don't necessarily get when you work in the corporate world. So I appreciate it. If you're, uh, uh, you know, if you're just starting out in your career and you want to go work at, you know, some big tech finance company or the def Department of Defense or something crazy like that, then your considerations are probably different from mine. But I, I try to live a, I work so much, I try to integrate my life as much as possible so that I can enjoy all aspects of it. In addition to doing everything else that I do, um, I'm the author of two upcoming books, uh, one called The Engaging Web, and the other one is called Game-Based Marketing, and they espouse a theory called Funware, uh, for which I've uh, become associated, and this is the premise that um, basically everything in the world could be more fun than it is today. You can take the lessons learned from the games industry around points and badges and levels and challenges and achievements and bake those into any kind of uh, life experience, whether it's getting money out of an ATM or working a suicide hotline. Um, games can help improve the outcomes um, you know, in every aspect of life, and increasingly we're seeing those uh, you know, trends around us. So Funware and the Funware blog, which is where I talk about um, Funware topics, um, it's just a sort of interesting way to package up all this movement um, in society around game mechanics in non-game contexts. Well, the suicide hotline example is a good is a good uh, is a good example. I was giving a talk at a conference, and and one of my co-panelists um, said, "Well, Gabe, this fun where idea of baking game mechanics into everything you do uh, sounds pretty exciting, but it would be um, absolutely inappropriate at something like a suicide hotline." And I said. Well, okay, I can concede that uh, adding games to suicide prevention seems distasteful at first, but I'll tell you what I do know. Here's what I know. In any call center setting, 
if you add a game mechanic like a competitive environment where you like uh, achieve more if you uh, you know answer more queries and sell more stuff um, people will answer more queries and sell more stuff number one and number two I know that um, you know it's a very very serious matter in which uh, you know successfully selling an idea aka not killing yourself is uh, actually a matter of life and death and so while I can't tell you that it will work because I haven't personally seen an example of it uh, working, I can't find any evidence that suggests it won't work. So uh, would I try it if I was running a suicide hotline? Absolutely. It would be the first thing I'd want to do is some kind of incentive structure to get the people answering the phone um, you know, in the right headspace. Consider what would happen if tomorrow Bank of America ATMs started dispensing $100 bills at random when you go to make a withdrawal. What would happen? Well, some people would say, okay, I will, I hate paying the fee, but I'll go to the Bank of America ATM if I already have to pay the fee because I'm not near one of my banks, might as well, I have a chance to win. All the way through to the other opposite reaction, which is I'm going to sit there and play that ATM like a slot machine doo -doo 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 to see if I can win the $100. The bottom line is what we know about the ATM funware example is that in every single case, it's going to produce a reaction which is something that you can't say about any form of traditional marketing. There's no other marketing technique I could bring to bear to guarantee some degree of reaction in people to go use a Bank of America ATM, except for the slot machine. You know, and of course there's like the legal issue, you know. But I, I think like, um, you know, one of the things that I, I think about a lot is the fact that I have yet to see an experience or, or personally experience anything in the world that couldn't be made more fun. I haven't played a game that is the ultimate expression of fun. I haven't like ha filled out my taxes and felt like it was fun. I haven't ever had that moment where I've said, we have reached the maximum point of fun. And uh, therefore, I know that there's plenty of opportunity to do more um, in the area of making things more fun. And you know, while initially it doesn't necessarily make sense to blur the lines between work and fun, um, you know, I'm confident that as time goes by and the current generation um, which we call Generation G, today's tweens, grow up to be older, they're going to expect everything to be more fun, and things that aren't fun aren't going to get done. You know, I love New York City, and I've lived here now for four years. After I sold my last company, um, you know, my partner is a fashion designer, and so I, we thought, well, you know, San Francisco is no great place to be a fashion designer unless you're really into polar fleece, in which case it may be the best place in the world to be a fashion designer. But we thought, well, you know, we can move to New York for his career, and I can start a tech company anywhere, because I knew I was going to start another one. And it turns out that New York has been great for uh, my partner's career, and, you know, it's pretty difficult to start a tech company here. But... Um, I love New York City and can't imagine culturally or intellectually wanting to move back to the West Coast. But I cannot get over the terrible, terrible Mexican food. Terrible. Horrible. And so every time I go back to San Francisco or L.A. and I'm fortunate to be there, um, you know, almost monthly, every single time I go back to the West Coast, my first stop is La Taqueria in the Mission um, or Mexico City in Los Angeles uh, where I get, you know, something delicious. And despite combing the edges of the five boroughs in New York, I haven't found anything good. Now, I often liken the experience of eating Mexican food in New York to um, running into your first love on the street after not seeing them for 20 years. Uh, there's no upside. Whether they've gotten really cute and you don't feel so cute or they're hideous and you feel really cute, um, the bottom line is that run-in is going to sully the beauty of the memory that you had of them. So all I do now is I politely decline every offer for Mexican food in New York City and save my needs until I, um, until I get back to San Francisco or L.A., or San Diego.